afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to call this September 22nd, 2022 meeting of the AMAS Policy Committee to order. The time was 1.30 and change. And they said on cue. <laughs> I heard you. You heard me. <laughs> I felt it. I felt okay. it. All right. So we're I guess it's gavel work there. I know. <laughs> All right, Ms. Salatel. Here. And Mr. Dunbar, but Mr. Boland, you're going to take his spot here. Mr. Charmley, here. Ms. Pokin, you are here. I think we have a quorum. That's right. Aaron, do you have any public comment announced to you? I do. AMAT's committee meetings are open to the public, and the public is provided an opportunity to comment at each meeting. Business items are first presented by staff or consultants. After that presentation is done, the committee has the opportunity to ask questions. Once the questions are done, the public is invited to formally comment. Each participant will have three minutes to speak on their topic. A couple of housekeeping items. If you are joining us virtually and you're not a member of the committee, please turn your camera off when you're not speaking on an item. If you're joining us by phone, to mute and unmute the microphone, press star six. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, moving on, do we have an approval of the agenda? Move to approve. Second. And seconded. Any changes to the agenda? Mm -hmm. Any objections to adopting the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Erin, right. um, do we have minutes from the group? We do not have any minutes this go around. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that made that. All right. On the action items. Action item 5A non SOV targets. Erin, are you going to be talking to those? Yes, I will. Okay, so these are another set of performance measures that AMS is responsible. These are for non-single occupancy vehicle targets. So what is a non-single occupancy vehicle? FHW defines it as travel any by any mode other than driving alone in a motorized vehicle, including travel avoided by telecommuting. So this is another set of federally required performance measures that AMS uh, must set a target for. Uh, very similar to the previous measures that we saw, the peak hour excessive delay, these measures are not uh, where DOT sets a target first and AMAT sets a target and they can be different targets. This is both groups have to come together and set the same unified target. Um, so uh, how do we get the data for this particular performance measure? There are three options. The first is by using the American Community Survey, which is a yearly update uh, that happens in between the census updates. Uh, it's a pretty robust system that can be used. We can use a local survey, a household travel survey, but it can't be more than two years old. So we don't have that available to us at this time. Or uh, the state and NPOs may use volume counts for each mode to make a determination. Uh, AMS staff sat down with DOT staff and determined that the American Community Survey would be our best source of information for this particular uh, performance measure because it's reliable, it's updated regularly, and it's easy to repeat any kind of data collection and calculations. The calculations are significantly easier, easier for this performance measure than the peak hour excessive delay performance measure. Basically what you do is you go into the American Community Survey and you find the single occupancy vehicle number that they have in there. So anyone that's counted as driving alone in a car, truck, or van of uh, commuting, you get that percentage you subtract it from 100, and whatever is left over is your non-single occupancy vehicle percentage. Super complicated. So, uh, and I can explain more if anyone needs. Um, in the DOT measure in front of you, you'll see some <clears throat> historical data from 2010 to 2020 that shows what the non-SOB percentage is for the AMATS area. It ranged from 24.4% to 26.2%. So after sitting down and talking with DOT and talking through any external factors, uh, we both decided to come up with a two-year and four-year target as listed in front of you. The, the two-year target is 24.5% and the four-year target is 25.0%. It is a small increase, but one of the things we're needing to do is wait to see how the data levels out or increases or decreases based on COVID numbers, because they did increase uh, during COVID and we want to see is that a continuing increase or is it leveling or decreasing? So one of the things staff is recommending is that we reevaluate these targets after the two year mark to see what the data says and see if we need to adjust these targets higher or lower. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the committee? 
Thank you. Um, question for Aaron. Um, the survey, does it specifically call out the telecommuting to, um, in the, the <coughs> recent version of it? Because, I mean, telecommuting or working remotely has become much more prevalent in the last two years than it was previously. So I'm just kind of curious if they called out for it. It doesn't call it out in the measure that we pulled from, no, unfortunately. And we're having a hard time being able to come up with what percentage telecommutes because the number was significantly higher during the COVID time and then it's kind of changed. Is that something we could add to, I believe it's in the tip to do a new, uh, the other survey? The household travel survey? Yes. yes. Could, we, could we have that in that survey? Uh, we were planning on okay. seeing what we can do to collect it. As, as we haven't actually started looking at that yet, we're not sure what kind of barriers we have. It shouldn't be too difficult to collect because I'm assuming we go out to each employer and talk to them, the major employers, and get that. But that is our plan. But I'll make a note uh, okay. to let the project manager know. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So now, what do you have to camp? I know. Where are you? I'm sorry, you just didn't be Okay. Any questions or comments from the public on non single occupancy vehicle targets? Okay. Hearing none, what is the world? Um, we do. I'm sorry. You do have one? Yeah. Was it, uh, Cheryl, go ahead. Hi. Thanks for the question. Um, I have a question about the Bay Area Transit Authority. Um, they have I heard that in determining our numbers, we, we mused it over with the state of Alaska. Uh, I'm hoping that we can become more aggressive about this. I, I understand that we don't have a plan or a program to reduce single occupant travel at this time. But it's a key element in reducing greenhouse gases. And so I think rather than just discussing what's the easiest way to go through this requirement from the feds to make our way through it, that we should take these measures more to heart and see how they are fitting into our attempts to reduce carbon emissions out of Anchorage. So we can let this one go by, but what actions are we taking today to, that is different, that are different from yesterday to reduce carbon emissions in Anchorage? That's that's what's on my mind today. Thank you. Sure. Any other public comments on this subject? Cheryl, can you state your name for the record, please? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one last call for any other public comments on this subject. Okay, hearing none. Do we have the will of the commission? Move we'll approved. Second. And second. Any objections to approving the motion? Hearing none. The motion is approved. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. But you're not done yet. Action <laughs> item 5B, transit asset management targets. Aaron, will you be talking about this? Yes, I will. Um, okay, so we have more targets. <laughs> uh, so these are for transit assets. So those would be buses or uh, vans or other things like that. It's spelled out all in the information, so I didn't want to bore you to death with it. But uh, AMATS is required to set targets for this particular uh, round of measures. The targets that you see before you were actually developed by the public transportation department as they are the asset managers um, and so what we've done in the past with these targets is we've adopted what transit provides to us since they are the ones managing all of these assets um, some may ask how are we helping to meet these targets there's actually a line item multiple line items in the tip but the biggest one we have is for uh, vehicle replacement bus buy um, for example, in 2022, we provided about 15 million to uh, public transportation department for bus buying that they use. And we continue to have a line item in there for each year. So that's how we help contribute. So staff's recommendation for these targets is to adopt the targets that public transportation department has set uh, for these performance measures. Thank you. Thank you sir. Any questions or comments from the committee? Here. Um, any comments from the public on this subject? Uh, this is Cheryl. I can't raise my hand for some reason. I would like to speak. 
OK, Cheryl Richardson, thank go ahead and. Yeah, thank yeah. you. This, this one is even more critical, I think, than the um, than the SU single occupant vehicle measure. Um, and I, I'm just. I understand this is asset management. We're talking hardware here. But at this point, uh, transit staff is not being asked to strategize how to improve, uh, expand transit service. And I would like to put a plug in on this agenda item for the policy committee sometime very soon to ask transit to strategize what next steps are needed to expand their service. Um, it was. It will be a very key factor in reducing greenhouse gases to up our uh, a bus ridership. So, again, this is a huge missing player uh, on the chessboard of how to reduce greenhouse gases. Our transit um, folks need to be come players instead of bystanders. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the public on this subject? Okay. Hearing none, what is the will of the committee? Move to approve. Second. Moved and seconded. Mr. Vaughn. Uh, any objections to approving the motion? Okay. Hearing none, the motion is approved. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, action item 5C, Rapid Creek Road project update. Aaron, will you be presenting on this? Yes, I will be. So, um, Rapid Creek Road project reconstruction is currently in the 2019 to 22 tip and the 23 to 26 tip. Uh, it's a project that would re reconstruct Rapid Creek Road from the Seward Highway to Golden View Drive and look at left turn accommodations where possible and include non motorized improvements where possible. Uh, AMAT staff received a memo from DOT and PF, which is attached in here, talking about some changes that they are looking, uh, they're requesting AMAT to make to the project. The first is changing the name from reconstruction to rehabilitation. Um, my understanding, and uh, the project manager is here to correct me if I'm wrong on this, that allows flexibility in um, for the project development as it goes forward in terms of what has to be done as part of it. Reconstruction is very strict on what it has to be done. Rehabilitation gives you more flexibility. So you, it helps avoid uh, right away impacts <coughs> and other things like that where possible. The second item is change the project scope um, to what I just read you. That's already been done. It's in the 23 through 26 tip. It's included in here because that was part of the original memo from DOT and I didn't want anyone to think we were missing anything in our ask. Um, and then the second is changing the cost estimate. The current cost estimate is 11.1 million. The new estimate is $35 million. Um, and again, the project manager can help speak to that project cost increase. The technical advisory committee re re reviewed these recommendations. They supported the recommendations with a change to the project description that's listed in here, but I'll read it out to everyone. The TAC recommends approval of these changes with a modification to the project description to remove the words where possible from the non motorized improvements. So the new description will read as follows project would rehabilitate Rabbit Creek Road from the Seward Highway to Golden View Drive and will look at left turn accommodations <coughs> where possible. Project will include non motorized improvements. So removing that where possible from there. So it's saying it will make the non motorized improvements. Um, staff recommended, and we're bringing this forward for action by the policy committee. So uh, I'm happy to help answer any questions on it, as well as DOT, who's here in force. Thank you. So the scope is changing, well, the cost is changing considerably. Um, when we look at dollar allocations, um, you know, we always look at uh, serving all parts of the community. So I'm curious. Um, when we look at how we else we could spend $35 million, has it ever been identified where else we could allocate those funds in the sense of like, uh, let me rephrase that, um, people affected by this versus other projects else running? Is that, is that part of the determining factors? Like this would benefit a thousand people, but if we took that and we did it up elsewhere, we could, we could positively affect 30,000 people. Um, we haven't looked at it at this point. Mm -hmm. Part of our new tip 
criteria did try to look at that a little more, especially, you know, equity or underserved populations. Okay. The criteria that was originally used for this project for the 2019 to 22 didn't do that as much. And we haven't rescored it under the new criteria or re-looked at it or anything like that. Um, we're really just trying to bring this forward to kind of get feedback from the committees of what they would like to do. So, Keith, and you have to forgive me because I don't necessarily always understand the process of the scoring. So, would would this project then go back to be rescored under the new the new standards, or would it not be rescored? Um, on its own, no. If if you wanted it to be rescored, we would need direction from the policy committee to go back and rescore it. Uh, the TAC's recommendation was to accept all of these changes as it or with their one change. So that would not be rescored. Okay. Project manager. Um, what would that do if we did ask for it to go back and be rescored? Uh, from our end, we would look at it and see how it compared to other projects that were scored for the 23 through 26 tip, and then we could bring that information back to the TAC or policy committee, whoever would like to see it, and then a determination could be made uh, what to do with the project at that point. Okay, so there's no hold up right now. If we, if we did that, is there ongoing aspects to the project that would like? I always ask that question. Yeah. What's the collateral <laughs> component to what our decisions are? I have to defer to the project <clears throat> manager on that. Yeah, so um, Steven Zepka, DOT, uh, Design Project Manager for this mm -hmm. project. Um, so right now the project is just in, in its infancy. It's just started. Um, we do have funding allocated for it where we are beginning to do information gathering and collecting. Um, so uh, we are beginning uh, working on the environmental document, um, beginning to, or we're planning on collecting survey information next spring. Um, and so if the project has to go back and, and be rescored. You know, at this point, we kind of pause the project and allow that process to occur. Um, so there would be, you know, some delay associated with doing that. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is important to kind of mention here, or why we're bringing this project forward, is you know, because the project is just in its infancy, what we want to do is make sure that the project under understands the intent of, of what is desired out of you know what was nominated. Um, that's part of the reason for the clarifications in the scope. And as we look at it and understand what we believe the intent of the project to be, you know, we've revised or updated, you know, the cost estimate, you know, based on that understanding. So we're bringing that revised estimate to you going, all right, this is what, you know, the you know, AMAS wants the project to be. This is the cost we're anticipating that's going to be associated with that. Um, yes, thank you. So it looks like in, so first, um, something I wanted to say to AMAS staff, um, it'd be great if the tip could just generally be in our packet because I pull it up during every meeting. Um, so uh, looking at the 20, um, 23 to 2026 tip, it looks like there's no monies allocated for 23. So any um, work being done is um, from the last tip, right? That's correct? Yes. That's correct. Okay. And so I think uh, to Mr. Trombley's question, I don't know that we would necessarily hold anything up if we wanted to go back and reevaluate if the currently funded work continues before you get into the 24 work, which was designed um, at $750,000 um, and then additional design in 2025. Um, my big question is, and, and this is why I'm intrigued by Mr. Trombley's idea is, this is a considerable price jump, and I'm not sure what's driving the price jump for this project. And frankly, a large portion of it is past 26. Um, so I'm not sure where we're going to end with this. We started at 11 million, we're at 35 million, and we're looking out past 26. Is this a $50 million road project? Um, where do we get the chance to drill down and evaluate that or start to place some cost constraints on it? Because $50 million, $30 million, I mean, we can't do that in a single tip. We can barely do that in two rounds of the tip. And so at what point are we just chasing after old projects that may not have current utility or aren't within any kind of scope that makes sense as you know our, our traffic needs and our transportation needs evolve so um i guess that's not really i guess what's driving the costs 
uh, right now? I mean, do we know? <laughs> sure. So I can kind of, you know, um, when we looked at um, updating this planning level estimate, you know, we looked at similar projects, you know, of a similar nature and what those historical costs were. Um, the two that I kind of, you know, loosely use as, as just comparisons are, you know, Abbott Road and O'Malley Road. Those two, from a cost perspective, are, you know, as far as scope goes, is, is similar intent. Um, and so we looked at those as well as a few others to understand, okay, where, you know, where did they end up? What were the costs of those? Because, you know, I want to be, you know, we want to come here at the beginning of the project and say, all right, realistically, this looks like we're going to be. Um, you know, I think everyone's hope is that, you know, 35 million is approximately where we end up and it's not going to continually jump up. Um, where that $35 million number comes from, you know, the largest component um, is certainly construction, but right behind that, um, because of the scope we're talking about, adding left turn accommodations <laughs> and non motorized facilities is in right away acquisitions. So currently, you know, our right away is 100 feet wide, you know, give or take. Um, and with the, you know, the, uh, the desire of the scope to add, you know, add left turn accommodations, add some sort of non motorized facility, we are going to need to acquire right away with the project. Um, Rabbit Creek is, you know, it has challenging topography where it's on the side of the hill. So, um, cut and fill slopes are going to extend further out and you know, we'll, we'll need that that space. So those are probably the two largest components of where the cost comes from. So you said um, Abbott and O'Malley, are those the same type of road classification as, as Rabbit Creek? Are they the same road class? Because I don't look at Rabbit Creek Road as anything like O'Malley or Abbott. I don't know what the road classifications for O'Malley and, and Abbott Road are on okay. those stretches. Um, I, I share more from a uh, a type of improvement type perspective where we're talking about you know both of those both of those were two lane you know, single mm -hmm. lane roads where we um, you know they added you know some kind of left turn accommodation and then uh, non motorized facilities to it. And then the other thing is in, in the upcoming tip, it looks like there's our 1.15 million for a right of way in 2025. I mean, that's a very small piece to a $35 million project. That must not be all of it then. No, and I apologize. I don't have the, the tip in okay. front of me. Um, the, I think the, the planning level estimates that, that we came up right away somewhere around 7 million, give or take. And, and that number, I will caveat, is incredibly, um, you know, there can be some fluctuation based on, you know, what flexibility we have with the design and you know, what impacts we can avoid. Um, I can tell you there's there are a few parcels that um, the dwellings are, are close to the right way line. And so depending on what the impacts there are, you know, that the number can, can vary. So the intent obviously is to try to avoid any of those significant impacts. But. I have one last question. Thanks. Um, Aaron, since this is a grandfathered project, it wasn't scored under the new criteria, correct? Correct. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm kind of in the camp with Mr. Trombley here. I think it's worth taking the time to rescore it and see see where it shakes out. Personally, um, it's a it's a big project, um, and I think we we need to. I mean, just grandfathering projects in and not taking a look at them when we change the scoring criteria so significantly to reflect our community's values and kind of what we're wanting to do um, gives me some pause. Thanks. Any other questions? I have a question. Aaron, you had forwarded us a comment that was received from the public in the new hall. Yes. And she had an idea for an addition with pretty specific language. I don't know if this is something that would normally be in the language of the project description. Um, or that would be some sort of with the design process, but she requested the addition of adding that a forest and buffer both the north and south sides of the right way will be preserved insofar as possible. Is that something that would typically be included in a project description that we could add in along with these other changes, or is that something that would best fit a bigger part of the process? I'm just kind of like your take on that. We don't normally add that kind of or information to a description, but um, if the committee wants, you're able to. However, I would have to defer to DOT in terms of discussion of what that means for the project, as I'm not sure. It, it would just be incredibly difficult to exercise. So when we go to execute a project, and I'm going to need a portion of your parcel for the improvement. 
I have to be able to demonstrate an authority and necessity to, to take that or acquire that piece of land. And I need to do that. So if, if you, some, for some reason, don't agree, and why do we need to go to court for a condemnation or an eminent domain action, I have to be able to demonstrate to the judge the authority and necessity for the thing. And I can do that based on toes of slopes or cut and fill slopes, utility relocation. It's very quantitative reasons. Um, but buffer reasons are harder to articulate and make the case for. Because Ms. Salatel might feel that she doesn't want to lose 20 feet of her lot just for your buffer, but you might feel that's important. And so implementing those things that are not standard um, ashto related design criteria uh, is really, really difficult to really have that conversation with any ability to enforce it. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, one, one more. Um, do we have a history of rescoring projects when um, scoring systems change? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm looking at Craig because he's yeah, wondering what it is. I am not aware of us doing that, but um, I have to defer to Craig to see if he has any other. Uh, Craig Lamb, planning director, former AMS. I, I've never, so rarely, it's just not something we normally do. They're in there, and, and the criteria is similar to previous criteria, usually over the years, and so they stay the same. Usually they're in there. Once they're grandfathered, once they have that approved environmental document. Okay. I would add to that. Um, if we all decided here today the values of our community, what's important and what's not important, whether it's multimodal, non motorized, what have you, buffers. Um, and then the, oftentimes a project like this will take five to seven years before it actually goes to construction. And then we're looking at a whole new set of faces here with a whole new set of values and a whole new different scoring criteria that's been implemented through MTP processes. And then we go back and say, hey, everything's changed now. And if we rescore this today, it doesn't merit moving forward. But at, in the meantime, we've invested a lot of resources, taxpayer money, into design and right away acquisition and utilities and all that stuff, only to be shut down at the bottom of the night many administrations later. That becomes a problem in implementing projects as we go through the process. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that perspective. And this one, though, isn't doesn't have action moving forward with it for right. two more years in this TIF, right. and it's in this information gathering yeah. stage. And so this is the I time to is, ask these questions. Yeah. Before so, we get started. But yeah. if we come back in seven years and the next crew here wants to redo it, now that's a problem. Yes. And I also think that there has to be time, though, even when there is that environmental document in hand. And the, I don't know if you went and listened to the TIF approval meeting, but there are changes. A project that gets designed a decade ago for a problem that existed where there are other routes to possibly resolve it or other things have changed. I think there still has to be some flexibility because the big money, while I appreciate there are millions to set up these projects, the really big money is the construction money in most of these. So. Um, and we always have way more demand than we ever have, you know, we have way more need than we ever have in this fiscally constrained program. And we're always picking and making choices. And I think that that's, um, it's something that has to take into account that there has to be some responsiveness and, and fluidity to it. I mean, so I appreciate that. I'm glad we're talking about this project so early on yeah. and that this change has come forward. Um, I also think that at least from what Mr. Levelton had told me, that the changes to the scoring criteria were pretty significant this time. Um, this isn't a minor change, these weren't tweaks. So I think that might warrant taking a look at some of those grandfather projects, maybe the ones that, not the ones that have their NEPA documents and are headed to construction, but that are in this early phase to make sure um, that they still match, they still do what we're wanting to do um, because I think that's important. Um, if we didn't, if we don't do that, then I don't think we're kind of doing apples to apples to comparisons of the projects that are in the TIF because some had this certain type of scoring criteria and others were just grandfathered in. So um, I think it's important to think about 
Um, I, I don't know um, if there's some way to do more systematic review versus a one-off, um, but it's. I think it's worth thinking about. Uh, yeah, I would comment that um, this is the perfect time to talk about this for this particular point. And even as projects develop, if there are a change in conditions that occurs that changes the purpose and need of the project or changes the basic assumptions of the project, that's a time where we can go back to federal highways. Because that's what I have to do. I go, have to go back to federal highways and I have to say I'm going to do a no build alternate elements. And these are the reasons why I have to demonstrate that. The Martin Luther King Drive extension is a perfect mm -hmm. example of that, right? It was started under a certain mm -hmm. basic assumptions, a certain purpose and need, and that purpose and need went away. So we felt we were able to make the case back to federal highways that <coughs> it's a no build alternative for these particular reasons. Mm -hmm. But if we can't make those quantitative connections about what has changed, that would allow me to make the case to federal highways mm -hmm. about why we're not going to go to a no build alternative, then that becomes a very difficult discussion that could occur significant financial um, liabilities uh, on the department. So okay. does that make sense? Yes. Um, and again, I think, you know, where sometimes the big money is in construction and like, I think we just have to be continually talking about things just because something was in the pipeline a decade ago. I mean, I don't want to divert from this project. We'll have to have that conversation hopefully again soon about 90 second and scooter. I mean, that's really kind of what's brought some of this to the head. So, um, but in this instance, I think, you know, we have these new equity scoring pieces. We have some new things in the scoring um, that really make me say, hmm, is $35 million at Rabbit Creek the right policy call? <clears throat> and I think one way to get more information about that is to possibly send it back through the new scoring. I have a question. Yeah. So how often is this scoring? criteria change. It sounds like this was like a, a big deal. Yeah, it can change with every tip update cycle. It can not change. It really depends upon the will of AMATS at that point. So this time it did was a pretty significant shift between the old criteria and the new criteria. Um, how, how long before that shift were we working sort of under the old version? I guess I'm, I'm trying to kind of get a gauge on because I can appreciate the comments about, um, you know, it could be a new body, it could be seven, eight years, but is this the type of shift that will potentially outlast us in the AMS policy committee? Is this something that is going to be changed in four years? I, mean, I guess it depends on the makeup of the policy committee. Um, I, I don't know. My perspective as coordinator is I think the overall direction and shift is something that is going to last forever because it's changing us in a way to where we are looking at equity more. We're starting in that direction more and more. Um, or we're really bringing up these questions of, you know, what areas do we focus on? What type of modes do we focus on? Are we okay with the, the policy breakdown of our funding percentages? I think those type of discussions and those changes are going to last regardless of administrations and people because I think the feds are headed that way. I think the nation is headed that way. So we're headed that way. And the community has talked about it as well, so I don't want to forget anyone from the community. Um, but small changes can happen between policy boards. Um, sorry, really quickly, I do want to mention one thing. So while the, the idea of the project overall, there is an actual fiscal impact to this tip. Uh, if the right-of-way cost is going to increase from the 1.1 million that we show in there to 7 million, uh, we would have to find where that funding would come from. That well, that was just mentioned today. I didn't oh. know about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I apologize, but uh, I think we we're still waiting for that final. So that's just another consideration is that we would have to look at how to absorb and where that would come from. <clears throat> so that could potentially impact other projects that are wanting to be started or um, already underway. So Ms. Allah, to, to clarify, our, the tech technical advisory community has recommended moving forward with this as restricted in the scope. Are you, are you, are I, I'm not in opposition to making these changes, but I think that we can do that and send it back for taking a look at the scoring. I mean, this is great that the technical advisory committee didn't take up the increased right-of-way 
cost yet because I think that would have had me asking for us to hit pause. Um, or I, I wouldn't want to make that policy decision in the TIP right now because I don't feel like I know where this project sits at this price tag um, compared to some other things that likely would be probably new projects that would fall away that were under the new squaring criteria. So I think we can do two things. I think we can say we can accept these changes um, and refer it back to be rescored. I think that gives us the both, you know, gets us new information if there is a TIP amendment that moves forward. Since this is somewhat an unprecedented event and you're asking this to be rescored, do you think we should have a broader discussion about when as a policy committee we relook back instead of already been assessed and scored? Yes. Because it's a broader. Yeah, right no, I agree. And I was looking at the tip, and this is why I love it in the packet all the time. I have I'm constantly looking at the tip. Um, may say something about me, but um, there aren't a lot of them that are grandfathered in that have significant, I mean, this is a significant change on a project that's grandfathered in. So this would have been great to have maybe when we were talking about the TIP approval, but it's come just after. So I think in some ways this is maybe a little bit unprecedented just in the timing. Would have been great to know this in this upcoming TIP. But we didn't have that opportunity because then we might have said, oh, that seems, I mean, it would have felt like an outlier then too, I think. I'm happy to have a bigger discussion um, and see if there's some system of, way to systematize that evaluation. But um, just a quick glance at what's being grandfathered in. Um, I think the only, actually, there aren't really any other ones that I'm aware of that have any significant. Issues or changes coming that seem um, that, that seem like they would be surprising. I mean, at some point we'll probably have to. Actually, that one has no funding for it. The Martin Luther King extension is there, but there's no funding in the two for it. So, um, yeah. Well, why don't we tackle the motion at hand first, sure. and then we can talk about the. Is there, is there a motion on the floor? Is it, do, do yeah. we still, do, oh, we still have to do public comment. We haven't gotten public comment. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you put motions on. That's mm -hmm. really good. Sorry. Can we clarify quickly? I think I heard conflicting information about whether or not um, there could potentially be any delay or hiccups resulting from a rescore. And I don't know how long a rescore would take, but I feel like I have heard one thing from the project manager and then something different from the discussion. I just want to clarify to the extent there's going to be any delay or. So, if this project is sent back for rescoring, I would try and get that done before the next policy committee meeting in October because our next amendment to the TIP is starting in November. And so, that would be the time to make changes to this project, either these changes or other ones. So, we would get it done in the next couple of weeks to make sure that we have it ready for the PC meeting. And that's. I don't think that causes any delay on the project side because it's within the next month or so. And just for my own edification, right now this project, the intent is AMS allocation to be applied to this. Correct. Part of state. Yes. Um, I, the reason I bring that up is that if, if this, if we decide that really, if this is important enough, the state will cover because the state is still up. correct. Yes. So it's the same. So, and what we've been doing, you kind of see, we've kind of been marching down the hillside, improving all those feeders mm -hmm. from the hillside because the hillside developed so quickly. And we never really did upgrade those roads. And this, this is just the natural progression of Abbott and O'Malley and up and now we're working all the way down to Red Creek. But, it, but again, these are state routes that are that, for whatever reason, the policy committee has, has, has decided to apply AMAS allocation. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to apply AMAS allocation. It could stand on its own and compete at a step level independent of AMAS allocation. And if the state decides that it's an important enough project to score and fund and get in as a new start, then maybe the state can use its funds to pay for that. And those AMAS allocation funds can be used for other things. Does that make sense? So that's just another way of looking as well. You, you, you might very well decide as, as a group here that, that there are 
because of the scoring, because of our new STIP criteria, we would rather put those funds in other more important locations based on equity or social economic demographics or whatever, um, and let the state take, take care of its facilities. Um, so that's another option. Okay, um, that said, any comments or questions from the public on this particular project? Uh, yes, oh, I'm sorry, hold on a minute, Cheryl. We have one, one comment in the room. Go ahead, Bert. Um, I'm with the Public Transportation Department, but this comment is not um, on behalf of that department. It's more as a transportation planner being involved with in AMAS for the last 12 years. And as someone who was on the scoring committee this last, for this tip that you're talking about, and a case for rescoring projects really should be a significant change in the scope of the project. And in this case, if you look at the old criteria, this project got points just for being a reconstruction project. So just by changing it to a rehabilitation project, it's gone so really close. And if the right of there's also one for unforeseeable obstacles, and one of the things is right of way. If it was presented as a $1 million right of way cost back then, it's now $7 million. That may have also reduced the number of points it got. <clears throat> and sometimes when you look at the projects being scored, the ones that get selected to be in the tip are often one or two points differences. So had this been scored as a rehabilitation project, may not have even made it to the case to even get into the tip. So it would be good to at least look at that aspect of the scoring criteria, um, because now we do have more things related to equity um, and AMS allocation is only you know, $30 million a year. Um, it would be good to relook at that from my perspective. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments? Cheryl, are you still on the phone? I believe it's Nancy. Oh, Nancy, I'm sorry. Either one. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm excited or pleased that this might be rescored. I have two questions um, that I hope will be part of the rescoring. And one is the induced traffic demand and the vehicle miles traveled. Um, this road being at the periphery of town generates long trips from residences to community destinations. Um, and if we are going to reduce VMT, then uh, reducing the longer trips is pretty important. Not inducing further longer trips is important as well. Um, so that's a concern. And then the other concern is, especially if this project might get punted over to DOT, who is speaking for the land use patterns that the city as a whole is trying to um, promote and to subsidize. Um, this project serves, um, you know, a low density area and we have high density areas where we're trying to build complete streets and help people use transit. So I'm hoping that there will be people in the rescoring effort that really are intimately familiar with the land use patterns and goals and visions of the community. Thank you. Do you have any other comments? Yes, the phone number last 43187. Um, whoever's on the line with the last four phone numbers, 3487? 3187. 3187. Yeah, hi, that's, that's me. This is, this is Ann Rappaport. I'm co-chair of the Rabbit Creek Community Council. Um, sorry, if on the phone, it's been a little hard to follow some of the discussion about the policy, and, and I am hearing there may be some redescriptions, et cetera. But um, however, the project ultimately ends up being proposed, two really critical points that Rabbit Creek Community Council supports. Well, first of all, thank you for, well, we were thanking you for making it rehab, but now that may be a different issue. Um, the two key points are we need a separated, non motorized pathway alongside Rabbit Creek Road. Um, you know, there's two schools along this road, one near the top and one about three fourths of the way up. And um, they, even though it is lower density and there's, but there's no bus routes in our area. So a non uh, motorized separated pathway is a really only safe option here because it's a very fast road with curves and hills. The other important point is that we want to make sure there are left turn pockets, not a lane um, for whatever or however the improvement may come. And that should be at Old Seward. Um, and that's really the only the safe way to do it on where there's a, such a steep area there and fast feet. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Ann. Any other comments online? Okay. 
have a comment? Okay, sir. I'm very grateful to be here, to be hearing all of this. Can you state your name? I'm sorry. Marcela Peña. Do I have three minutes where I can see where the three minutes are? Um, I have it on my phone and it'll beep. I can give you a heads up if you have certain. At every one minute and 30 seconds if you need to. Okay. Um, very grateful to be here to be hearing the testimony that is being presented regarding this project. Rabbit Creek Road. From Rabbit Creek Road out of Seward Highway on up to Golden View Drive. What an incredible stretch of road. I am personally attached to Rabbit Creek Road because on November 8th of 2020, my mom committed suicide from that bridge. As a result of Title 11, both of my parents passed away on that day. So when I hear things like reflections of our community's values, acquisitions, Title 11, Title 11 was used to decimate legacy owners of taxi permits. My parents owned eight taxi permits. My father was in the industry for 25 years. 20 of those years were glorious years. The five final years were a freaking nightmare. Thanks to the assembly, thanks to transportation commission, thanks to transportation inspection, three agencies work in collaboration to decimate an industry, to decimate legacy owners. So when I hear of community values, I, I have a, I have a large problem with hearing that in regards to this project and the neglect that it was reflected in Title 11. I mean, 11, I mean, 11 I mean, 30, sorry, I mean, 30. I have done presentations with the assembly last year. I did a presentation again with the assembly this year. I did a presentation with Transportation Commission this year. All have expressed the regret that they did with Title 11 and how it decimated the legacy owners of taxi permits. My parents owned eight taxi permits and I had a valuation of over $1 million. On the day of their death, it was reduced to $44,000. Thanks to the intent of three agencies working together to decimate via Title 11, which disregarded community values. There is certainly not a community that I would associate myself with that would denigrate and disable an entire economy. Legacy owners were decimated. When I gave a presentation to Transportation Commission in August, they expressed, they expressed regret and told me they gave full, full, um, full support for me to take this to court. When I gave a presentation in September, I made them aware that there was a typo in that delegation of authority that I used to sell five of the eight taxi permits. That delegation of authority with the typo on it, typo that ex the typo was in the case that gave my brother and me executive power over my father's estate. My father was the second to die on that day. That delegation of authority, which is an invalid document, was used to sell five taxi permits. In a few minutes, sorry. I want my five taxi permits back. Any other public comments at all? Anything online? Okay. <clears throat> all right. So, regarding the Technical Advisors Use Committee's recommendations on Rabbit Creek Road project update, what is the will of the committee regarding that issue? Second. And second. Any objections to approving the motion? Motion's approved. Um, before we move on to the next item, um, I'm kind of I just wanted to maybe speak for a moment. Do you think a working group can talk more about the the wins and where's about when we reconsider rescoring things is appropriate at this time? Um, just to give it a broader, <clears throat> little more focus and not try to jam it into the, this agenda today. Do you think that would be? Acceptable. Yes, um, and I'm not sure if 
we need to be mindful though on this particular project if it's been identified with Aaron's time constraint if it was intending to be part of a tip amendment in November just based on the yeah. cost increase and other things. We can certainly expedite it and okay. get a doodle poll going and can try to have a meeting sure. in a next couple of weeks and okay. cover that out a little bit there. Okay. Uh, I think that would give it the credence for the, okay. what it needs. Yeah. yeah, as long as we can have that conversation, if this comes back for a tip amendment and we haven't figured out what we want to do, then I will probably delay that portion of the tip amendment. Just give me the heads up. Okay. okay. Sorry, I guess I have uh, clarification. So do you want me to rescore this Rabbit, this Rabbit Creek project, have it rescored and brought back um, in October to the policy committee for review? I think what we're talking about here is a sidebar working group to discuss when when it's appropriate to go back okay. and rescore, whether it's a, a significant cost increase or a change in conditions or whatever that might be, or it hasn't started really yet and it's okay to change it. Uh, when are the conditions appropriate to rescore things that have already previously been scored? Okay. So is, there, okay. is that some kind of a stick? Um, I have a question about that. Is, is yeah. That in our government documents that we can send something back to be rescored. Like I guess I, I wouldn't want to put too tight of constraints around when the policy committee can request for something to be rescored. You guys can request it any time. There's no there's no limitations in our operating agreement or policies and procedures about when you can have a project rescored. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is October we're already gonna have a work session on the MTP fiscal constraint analysis. Um, so historically, two work sessions in a month have been difficult to work through. So um, I was kind of going to ask, would you guys still want two work sessions, one for this and one for the MTP fiscal analysis? Um, I don't know if that's going to be possible. Yeah, we have to set out a doodle poll on it, and it's going to be about two hours long of fiscal analysis work. So tagging on a discussion about two hours long of fiscal analysis work. So tagging on a discussion about rescoring projects it would probably extend another hour or more. So it'd be a long week. Sure. I mean, I'm, I don't mind tagging it on. I mean, that's that's what we do. I think it's related. I mean, when we start talking about fiscal considerations, I mean, that's the first consideration I have on this one. So sure. yeah, no, I think it's appropriate. Trying to find one day with a block is probably easier than multiple. I'm going to do that. We'll just tag it on here. Okay. If it ends up adding a half hour or an hour. Sounds good. I'll make sure to include that when I send it out to the Google poll of what the whole meeting is going to include. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Aaron, any other action items for Ms. Marina? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Agenda item 6A, Ocean Dock Road Reconstant Study. Aaron, you're on. I am not actually. I will pass it over to the consultants who will be discussing well, this project. So, hi, I'm Kevin Jackson. I'm uh, I work with the Department of Transportation. I'm the chief of the preliminary design and environmental section. I'm here on behalf of the project manager who is enjoying some uh, well deserved time off, Galen Jones. Um, I think he uh, brought before you about a year ago, introduced the design team for this study, um, and they're here. Uh, we hired Kenny Engineering and uh, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you. Um, uh, so we're here to uh, report on the activities that we've been uh, doing with this project and kind of where we are, what we found. Um, so are you going to switch for me? Sure. Sorry, can you state your name? Uh, yes, Jeannie Bowie with Kinney Engineering. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, we can just keep going. Uh, so just a reminder of where the project is and what we're doing. It's a reconnaissance engineering study. It's in the area of the um, port. It starts um, on the south at Ship Creek Trail or, or Ship Creek, um, goes up Ocean Dock Road into the port area up to the Roger Graves Road in the port. Uh, it's a reconnaissance study, so we're answering questions like uh, why is the project needed? What solutions are possible? What benefits and impacts are expected? Um, and then kind of overall uh, uh, an understanding of what is needed and what it will cost so that um, projects could be programmed and funded. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the first thing that we did was we looked at purpose and need for the project and uh, we identified basically kind of six areas of need for the project. Uh, the biggest one is reducing delay at the railroad crossings. 
or a number of places where the railroad and the road uh, meet, and uh, a, that causes a lot of delays. Trucks are going in and out of the port, and the, the railroad is, is trying to conduct their normal operations. Uh, we also uh, identified there's a, a demand for non-motorized facilities in this area. It's very industrial, but there's also Ship Creek, which has the trail. There's Government Hill, where people live. There's a lot of reasons for people to be walking and biking in the area. Uh, there's also some rec uh, other recreational stuff going on there. Uh, truck operations uh, was another need that we identified. Uh, this was mostly identified in the previous project that was done, but this one is kind of uh, pulling in. Uh, so truck, truck drivers gave us a lot of input on uh, problems that they were experiencing. Um, so we're trying to uh, overcome them. Um, another one is reducing the potential for crashes. There hasn't been uh, a large number of crashes in this area, but a crash could have a, a big impact, um, either um, costly in terms of a lot of infrastructure impacted or, or even just in terms of delay as um, it keeps people in and out from coming in and out of the port. Um, and then the final um, purpose and need uh, is to reduce maintenance and to improve drainage, which also has an impact on the maintenance. Next slide. Uh, so this spring, we did a conceptual study, which we uh, took to our advisory committee. Um, we looked at the latest guidance on walking and biking um, in industrial areas and around train tracks. Uh, we looked at the drainage improvements needed, and then we also came up with four, dis four different concepts for for ways that the tracks could be moved to, to meet the purpose and need, and four different road concepts as well. Next slide. Uh, so we've uh, gotten the input from our advisory council, and we've developed a proposed concept that would meet the purpose and need. And I've got it kind of listed here, but I think uh, you'd get a better idea if you looked at the, the handout that I brought. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, so basically what this is doing is it moves the railroad tracks. They're currently run along the, the east side of Ocean Dock Road, and it would move them to the west side of Ocean Dock Road. That eliminates uh, the two crossings that are highlighted in like a purple pink color. Uh, those are the highest delay crossings and the crossings with the, the highest uh, safety concerns. So it would remove them from, uh, from the area and thus like, uh, increase or decrease the delay quite a bit. Um, it also incorporates the recommendations from the previous study that was done. That study focused just on the one intersection, this one here, of the C Street ramps with Ocean Dog Road. Um, those those um, recommendations would improve sight distance uh, for truck drivers as they're driving in that area and also improve the drainage to decrease maintenance. And then the kind of third big area of improvement is all the way at the south end at Whitney Road. It would reconfigure Whitney Road, which addresses some safety concerns that were um, uh, described to us. Uh, it would reduce delay and it would also decrease uh, a maintenance burden that happens when uh, vehicles strike the, the rail equipment because of the tight turn that it has right now. Um, next slide. Um, and then the, the project also would uh, build, or build pedestrian infrastructure. Um, it builds a path between Ship Creek Trail on the south, goes up Ocean Dock Road and then up the C Street ramps to connect to the existing path, path on East Loop that goes to Government Hill. Um, and would build widened shoulders for non-motorized travel to the port of Alaska um, in kind of determining where we would put the non-motorized facilities. Uh, we've been considering how could we reduce cross crossing distances at roads, uh, making sure that the non-motorized facility crosses the rail in perpendicularly, which is a safer uh, path for bikes. Um, We've thought about the signs and signals that would be needed at the rail crossings. We've tried to cross lower volume roads where we could, and uh, we've also dealt with grades. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so there's some big challenges to uh, these construction improvements in this area. Um, we want to minimize impacts to leasable land in the area. Uh, both the railroad and the port have leasable land there, and we want them to be able to continue to use that. Um, there are extensive utilities in this area. Some are known and some are not known, so there will be conflicts and relocations that will have to occur with that. Um, in terms of environmental impacts, uh, Government Hill has some historic areas, uh, properties and parkland that will have to be considered. And then a, a big one is traffic control during construction, how to get uh, people in and out of the port and the, the rail still using their facilities uh, while, while we're constructing. So those are kind of things that will have to overcome. Next slide. Uh, so where are we at? We have the draft reconnaissance study that, that proposes this improvement and describes it and its impact. Uh, we're just about to start the public comment period, which will go for 30 days and we'll gather comment on the recon study. Uh, so then we'll make revisions. That'll be about the end of October and finalize the report in November. Um, and then it'll be ready for programming and funding. Um, and we've identified right now it's about 46 million. Uh, that's what I've got. Any questions or comments? Questions or comments from the public on this project? Railroad is silent. Silence is consent, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> the railroad's <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Okay, Aaron. Um, I guess we've got action, or I'm sorry, agenda item 6B, Stewart Highway, Diamond to O'Malley. 92nd Avenue of Undercrossing, and I guess this is where we provide feedback on what they're going to present in November. So, sorry. so we uh, took the motion that was passed by the policy committee at the last meeting. I wrote a letter with the exact wordage. I also <coughs> added in the whereas is from the assembly resolution and attached the assembly resolution because I thought it good, gave good background as the concerns heard from the public and the assembly. Um, and then I asked uh, the project manager to come present to the assembly these all you know the respond to the assembly members uh concerns the tac edited the letter and added uh that they would like to include an analysis and cost estimate for non-motorized grade separated concepts to include at least one over and one under crossing um so to adding a little more to the concept the cost estimates what it would take to do something like that um and they approved that letter and they sent it out the day after the TAC approved it. So I just want to give an update to the committee members that we are moving forward and we are anticipating being able to report uh, what happened because uh, they're coming at the, T the November TAC meeting to present. Um, and so at the policy committee meeting, I'll be able to give an update on what happened at the TAC meeting. Okay. So I just want to keep you up in. Question, sorry, um, I maybe didn't track everything. The TAC wanted grade separated pedestrian as an inclusion of a vehicular underpass or on its own. I'm sorry, can you just provide a little clarity? I, and maybe Brad Coy, the TAC chair, can help with this a little. Um, they added in saying that whatever response DOT gave to the TAC members about the feasibility of changing the vehicular under or changing it from a vehicular undercrossing to a pedestrian undercrossing, they wanted a cost estimate included in there so we knew how much that was going to cost for that undercrossing as well as an overcrossing over the highway. Okay, I tried and it now. I think it's just more information that I didn't include originally. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Any other questions? Any questions from the or comments from the public? Nancy Pease. Yes, um, yes. Thank you to the um, policy committee for taking a serious look at this project. Uh, with regard to the information that will be coming to you on um, in November, um, I think there's. Well, first, I guess I should say I'm sure we all noticed sadly that. Um, a teenage boy, 13 years old, was hit while riding his bicycle on Brayton Drive. He did have serious injuries, but he appears on the road to recovery. Um, that's right in this area. There's an analogy here 
and I'm a little concerned that DOT is providing the um, all of the information for re for consideration of this project. When you don't feel comfortable with the recommended treatment from your doctor, you usually go to a different doctor. In this case, AMATS is going back to the same doctor, the same specialist, DOT, the same staff that have worked on this project thus far. So I think it's really important since you're going back to the same source that you ask very specific questions so that you get additional information and not just confirmation of the project. And in particular, I'm hoping that you will look at some of the purpose and need. Um, there have been a number of road projects. Um, Independence Drive is connected to O'Malley Road. Uh, Elmore now connects Tudor and Abbott. There's a planned diverging diamond at O'Malley and the Seward Highway. There have been lots of improvements at Lake Otis and Tudor and Dowling. So um, I'm hoping that there will be some consideration of the, the road projects. Um, in addition, the land use changes have changed since this project was envisioned. Cotton Center, Abbott Town Center has an increasing array of services. Huffman Town Center has an increasing array of services and better access with the new roundabouts. All those land use changes have not been, uh, I don't think, given due consideration in past transportation decisions. So I'm asking the policy committee to consider what questions do you want to ask about land use changes in this area? And also asking you to weigh in with your priorities in other areas of town slated for infill and redevelopment and complete streets that will add value to adjoining lands instead of this one, which just moves more traffic and induces more traffic. We have been trying, my citizen advocacy group, to get some detailed information, data about um, traffic flows. And we've been given a polite response from DOT that department staff is limited in what they can revise or explore after a project has gone through all the steps and years of planning and design that this one has. So with that being their kind of baseline, I'm asking this committee to put forth specific questions and try to get DOT to dig up a little more detailed data for your analysis. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions from the public? All right, moving on. Uh, Aaron, any other further project or plan updates at this point? No, sir. Okay, we're going to go on to agenda item seven then general information, general information item seven A, October policy committee meeting. Aaron, let's see. Um, we have a change to the October policy committee meeting that I just want to let you know about. We're going to have to move it up a week uh, to the 20th of October. Uh, and I want to give you all a heads up in person before we send out that change. Um, and I'm sure that everyone <laughs> uh, is happy with that change, but unfortunately, AMAN staff will be, at, be out of town the last week of October. We are going to the AMPO conference, uh, the nationwide MPO conference, where we are given the opportunity to meet with sister MPOs and talk with them about uh, questions that we have on them. So we have a lot um, that we have on our plate, and we're actually bringing along with us a transit, a person from transit, so they can participate as well because they are an active member in our group. So we're very excited for it. It's going to be very busy um, this year, so we're going to have to change the meeting and we'll send out the change of notification to everyone. Um, any other further general information items at all? I have one other thing I'll go ahead and mention. Uh, we have a new planner at AMATS for those who, have, who don't know. Uh, Chelsea Ward-Waller has been hired as our new transportation planner, senior transportation planner. We're very excited to have her on board. She will be primarily responsible for the MTP update, both the current one that is going on and future MTP updates. So as a quick heads up, I'll be transitioning away from project manager of the MTP update um, in the next couple of months or so after we finish the fiscal analysis and then turn it over to her in her capable hands. Um, I'm very grateful and excited that she's on board and I look forward to the enthusiasm and constant change that she brings with her. <laughs> okay, um, any, any committee comments at all? General information, regrets? 
Yeah, I, so I know this is going to be on an upcoming agenda, but I would like to ask a question about the the letter that was sent to the municipality um, regarding the gold mine. And uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this sort of the timing on this project at a future date, but just because I, I feel like um, things are sort of time sensitive with trying to get our emergency homeless shelter plan online in the very near future. Is there anything about the timing of the project as referenced in the letter that would preclude the Golden Lion being used for a different purpose uh, in the interim? Um, or maybe you, you could speak to speak to the timing. You know, it's not in the SIP yet. Um, there's not a NEPA process that's been done. I mean, is this four years, five years, six years out? <coughs> Um, there has been a request to provide this kind of information at the October meeting. Um, so I don't know how far into the details you want to go in advance of that request. I think the really poignant question is if there's a question before the body on Monday about turning the gold line on, making it an active facility to be used, is there anything about your letter that precludes that from happening? No, we, we the, the department is does not control or manage or own that property as it sits today. Um, the only real action that has occurred is we have, uh, as a result of a sale from the previous owners of the municipality, uh, we, 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 we revoked the per permitted parking area uh, directly adjacent to the highway. Um, so that has been taken out of play as a part of the property that is usable by whoever owns the property today. Um, and until we go far enough down the process of project development and purpose and need and preferred alternatives and all that stuff to actually identify what additional impacts there would be to the problem. There's we we don't have really a say in what that property can or should be used for moving forward. Does that answer your question for now? Thanks. Okay. And we'll we'll get into more details in the next month's update as well. Um, we can kind of follow further down that road. I would ask that you be uh, a little bit, I guess, respectful that your questions, if they go too far down um, what we would call predetermined outcomes, that those are uh, by, by definition in violation in predetermined outcomes of NEPA policy. And so for if you're going to ask me, well, what are you going to do? Why would you nick this? What would cause that? We really can't go into the real levels of detail that would violate the NEPA process in terms of talking about predetermined outcomes. So I would just ask for patience. No, I think what we're looking for is really timing, um, sequencing. I mean, I think for because this is such a <clears throat> high profile piece of property in the municipality, really talking about what are the steps for a project. Folks don't know what we often know and how these unfold. Um, and we really need to be armed with accurate information to go talk with the public um, and understand where this piece fits into the broader yep. um, path forward. Yeah. No, I can I completely appreciate that, and uh, and also keep in mind I think Ms. Alta, you were a part of the effort for the Midtown Congestion Relief. Really. And this is all really nothing more than a culmination of that larger core mm -hmm. planning event, where we're now just starting down that road of making those and addressing the safety and the accident data at the, at this intersection. Identify projects of independent utility. Yes, I I've gotten that language down. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're getting good, you can replace me. <laughs> so anyway, but more to follow on that. Um, Great. But looking forward to further discussions. Great. Any other comments for the committee for general purpose? Okay, Aaron, I think we're getting to the end here. Any more public comments? Nancy Pete. Yes, I have a public comment. Yes, ma'am. As I stated in my previous comments, um, in the September meeting with Transportation Commission, I showed them that um, I mentioned the typo that exists in the delegation of authority document, which allows me to regain possession of all five permits last year, from last year. I have been asked to come to the table and not file a lawsuit. This city has definitely opened themselves up 
itself up to a massive lawsuit for what it did to the legacy owners. If you truly want to reflect the community's values, I seriously suggest that you reevaluate what was done to legacy owners via Title 11. And I seriously recommend that you that the renewal fee that legacy owners and all taxi cab owners are made to pay every year um, be withheld from having to be paid by all legacy owners in perpetuity or 50 years minimum as a way of repaying them for the assets that were stolen from them by three agencies working together in the city. When the expression was made about acquiring right of way acquisitions, if a, if a city is going to decimate assets, it should acquire them. But it did not give that decency or sense of respect to the legacy owners of the taxi cab permits. And so by not having to pay the yearly re renewal fee, you will be doing something to help the legacy owners. And so if you really are committed to reflecting community values, I suggest that you come to the table and you give me solid options because I am prepared to pursue every option. And if it means going to 20 states and interviewing legal counsel and finding somebody that is way smarter than me, that is what I intend to do. I will find legal counsel in the state. I will find legal counsel outside of the state. Come to the table with something solid, something that reflects your community values. You're shy of that. You have opened yourself up to a massive lawsuit. Thank you for your time. Any other public comments? Nancy? Yes, thank you. Yes. The uh, AMAC yeah. allocates funding in 2023 for a recreational trails plan update for the Anchorage Bowl. And um, I've raised questions to the mm -hmm. staff about the scope of that plan because it combines trails that are utilitarian, which they call primary and secondary linkages, um, with those that are purely recreational, like single track bicycle trails. And given that there are um, different standards and different sources for funding and maintaining transportation trails versus recreation trails, I remain concerned that categorizing urban pathway linkages recreational might handicap their funding and maintenance. So I just wanted to let the committee members um, know that I'm, I've reached out to AMAT staff right uh, recently, I haven't heard back yet, to hear what are the definitions for recreational trail and um, you know how these uh, definitions have been adopted and do they need to be updated. Um, in the longer term, I'm hoping that, that AMATs will be part of a discussion as to whether certain pathway linkages should be part of the transportation infrastructure. And if so, do we want to continue to ask Parks and Rec to try to fund and maintain them? Or should they be um, the responsibility of our, our much larger transportation agencies? So just as an update, um, just getting going on this, and I'm looking for the definitions for recreational trail that are um, that AMX is currently using. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? You're shaking your head now. Okay. Um, as one last comment, uh, as the chair of the AMX, um, I wanted to um, float out a concept that I'm going to be running by for official input by the policy committee. Right now, under AMATS, I believe the way the wording is, 15% of the AMATS allocation, in theory, is supposed to be routed to preservation-related activities. Um, there is no further detail other than just that. So um, I spent quite a bit of my summer riding the bike paths in Anchorage, and a lot of the trails, whether municipal-owned or park and rec-owned or DOT-owned, are in fairly poor disrepair. And so uh, my intent is to propose a percentage allocation of that 15% preservation allocation that would be identified as a goal in uh, preserving non-motorized um, separated facilities. Um, so I want to float that out there. I, I can't imagine anybody that would disagree with trying to 
um, make some targets or some goals in that regard. Um, I know that the, there are three real distinct owners of those facilities in this town, so it would have to be a collaborative, um, some type of you know, conditions assessment and incorporation into, uh, into our TIP. But I think there's probably some goodness into it, especially given the ever growing uh, desire to have non motorized and uh, multimodal improvements. <clears throat> You're going to see a, a recommendation for, for something like that. If you have thoughts on it, feel free to let me know. But I think that would be a very formal recognition of the need that's out there in keeping these trail systems uh, up to speed. I know you would like to say something on that, Aaron. Go ahead. <laughs> Just as quick clarification, it's 15 to 20 percent over the four years of the tip. Okay, 15 to 20 percent. But again, not it doesn't go any deeper than that. And I think uh, I think really, if you probably look at it holistically as a system, the, the liability really isn't huge. And if we did designate a couple hundred thousand years for ongoing term contract type trail, just replacement in place, I think there'd be a lot. I'll be interested to see what the intersection is of that with, isn't there already trail replacement funds in the tip? And so what the intersection of the two ideas is. Yeah, the, the uh, coordinating of those mm -hmm. and the integrating of those two together. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so we want to make sure we're not just giving separate direction. Yeah. Other than that, that is all I have. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. <laughs> All right, great. Any objection to approving the motion? Hearing none, the motion is adjourned. Thank you. Aaron, I, this may be a, uh, my handicap.